Good evening. Uh, I want to first and foremost uh, thank everyone for attending all the sessions of the conference. By all standards, this has been a very successful conference of two days of exchange of ideas and the very free, open, and very civil. Um, when there is a war taking place, you always fear that emotions might bubble up and erupt into ugly scenes, but it's Montana, it's University of Montana, and I'm very proud to say that all our discussions and debates have been very open, free, and civil. Uh, I want to, first and foremost, remind everyone that this incredible work of organizing a conference for the last many months is the result of the work of many individuals. And uh, some of them are here, some of them are not. Um, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank, and I want to ask uh, the people I named to stand up and be recognized, Dr. Ardi Kia, the co-director of Central and Southwest Asian Studies Center. Please, Ardi. Uh, our dear friend, Chris Hislop, the executive director of the Montana World Affairs Council, who has also, aside from everything else, has worked diligently on putting this on the Facebook and making it, um, uploading it later for YouTube, right? And this is a question several people asked, you know, it will become available as a, a YouTube option. Uh, I want to thank my good friend, Bob Seiden Schwartz. Bob, please. Um, uh, somebody who has worked behind the scenes diligently and has helped uh, me, Adi, and others uh, every day working with Bob, working with Chris is Joyce Brucin. Joyce, please uh, stand up and be recognized. Uh, we are uh, honored and privileged to have with us uh, the former governor of Montana, a person who does not need any introduction, uh, Governor Brian Schweitzer. Uh, I was reading his bio and it starts with the following sentence. Governor Brian Schweitzer is a farmer and rancher who held no elected office uh, prior to being uh, elected as the first democratic governor to serve Montana in 20 years. Uh, that says a lot. Um, he's the grandson of Montana homesteaders. Uh, he grew up on his folks cattle ranch in the Judith Basin. Uh, governor Schweitzer went on to earn a bachelor of science uh, degree in international agronomy uh, from Colorado State University and later um, earned a master of science degree in soil science from Montana State University, okay. Bozeman. <laughs> There's not going to be any Bobcat Grizz tonight, <laughs> Governor. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> uh, he uh, worked overseas extensively on agricultural projects and has visited uh, more than 37 countries across the world. Uh, Governor Schweitzer oversaw the building of uh, uh, major, major irrigation projects and the construction of the world's largest dairy farm of all places in Saudi Arabia. And he's the only governor who appreciates and knows quite a bit about Arab culture and Arabic language. Um, so, salamun alaikum, as they say, that peace be upon to. Uh, and uh, with uh, his unique global perspective, Governor Schweitzer is a leading national voice to end our addiction to foreign oil by developing clean and green American energy with uh, uh, Montana leading the way. So it's a special honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, former governor of Montana, Governor Brian Schweitzer. Once the governor is uh, uh, finished with his presentation, we will have a wonderful discussant 
who will uh, join us. And Jennifer has worked so hard these last two days. She had her own presentation and so on and so forth. But I will leave the introduction of Jennifer in a more comprehensive fashion to our friend Bob uh, Seidenschwartz. But for now, let me introduce to you, and I want to ask you to help me uh, give a Montana welcome to Governor Brian Schweitzer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I suppose I should start by blaming uh, Mrs. Deegan for me being here today. Mrs. Deegan, she was my fourth grade teacher. Uh, one day, Mrs. Deegan walked into the classroom. There was only eight of us in that, in that fourth grade. Uh, we were out there in the Judith Basin at the Geyser School, and she uh, she walked in and she said, "Class, we're going to do something a little different. Um, in this hat, I have eight different words, and your responsibility is to take the whole week, and uh, you can use the the school library or wherever you want to get your information. And uh, uh, we're going to have next week, uh, every day, we're going to have a different presentation from a different person in this class." It'll be an oral presentation, but you need to be an expert about what you're talking about. <laughs> so she brought the hat around and I, I reached in and I pulled out and the word was Argentina. Argentina. I, the rest of the kids didn't have countries or cities or anything. They, some of them had an animal. Some of them had a, a, a river. Argentina. So fourth grader, I mean, your research consists of going to the encyclopedia, right? And that's where I got most of my information. And I read about Argentina, Argentina. Now this is a ranch kid. And I had never been anywhere, as you mentioned, my all four of my grandparents came from Europe and homesteaded in Montana 110 years ago. And the whole world I knew was that ranch. And I read about Argentina and I found that this place, Argentina had bigger glaciers than even Montana. It had rivers that were wider and bigger than the Missouri River. This was my whole world. This is what I understood. And then I read something about a place called the Pampas of Argentina, where it said in the encyclopedia that the grass in the Pampas, and it was 500 miles in diameter, the grass would grow as tall as the saddle horn of a horse. Now, for a, for a 10 year old kid from a ranch, my God, imagine the cattle you could raise there. I just had vision of seeing Argentina. And so it became somewhat of a passion of mine from the time I was in fourth grade because of that damn Mrs. Deegan of wanting to get out and see the world and I needed to see Argentina. And so I ended up going to Colorado State and uh, I got a degree not in agronomy, but in international agronomy because I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to get to Argentina. And so I got that degree and I was ready to go. And, you know, a lot of the recruiters said, really, you know, if you're going to work internationally, you need to get an advanced degree, you need to get a master's. So I went up to Montana State and I got a degree in soil science. And uh, a day after I defended my thesis, I was on a plane and it wasn't Argentina. Um, the best I could do was Libya. And of course in Libya, um, I got that job because clearly nobody else wanted it. Um, and I found the first time I flew into Libya, it was, they were leading the world in uh, skyjackings. So the only way you could get there, the only way you could get there was to fly to Zurich. And when you got to Zurich, there was only three flights a week that went to Tripoli. And here's how your flight worked. You, uh, you checked your luggage and they put that luggage on a truck. And when it was time for you to leave, they put you on a bus and they drove you out all the way to the end of the runway to get on your plane. And you picked your bags when you got on that plane because, you know, they get skyjacked a lot and sometimes they get blown up. But that was my first job. And so I was in the Sahara Desert just above Chad and Niger in the driest place on the planet where we were developing irrigation. We were drilling wells and, and planting crops in big center pivots. You know what they are, those round fields that you've flown over. I'd only been there for a year and I was recruited by a Swedish company. Um, and I was only 25 at that point. And uh, they had a plan to build what became the world's largest dairy farm. And they had a lot of Europeans that knew cattle and they knew feeding. And they had third world nationals already lined up from Pakistan and from Egypt and, and from Sudan and Philippines. Uh, but they didn't have anybody that knew irrigation. So they took a risk on me. And so I went to Saudi Arabia and we developed that farm. We drilled those wells, put in those pivots and 
somehow grew enough alfalfa to feed those 12,000 head of cattle. And it wasn't, oh, but a year and a half I was there. The king had been hearing these words coming from the United States, Paul Harvey. Now, you students back there never heard of him, but you old duffers up front, you remember who Paul Harvey was? He was on the radio uh, every morning uh, nationally. And this was uh, the late 70s, early 80s. He had a slogan. His slogan was a bushel of wheat for a barrel of oil. Those Arabs have got all the oil, but they don't have anything to eat. And so even the king of Saudi Arabia, who was the son of a Bedouin king who had an eighth grade education, that word got to him too. And he recognized at what risk they were since they imported 98% of their food. And so um, just short of two years after I arrived there and built that first industrial farm, the king announces that we are going to become self-sufficient in food in Saudi Arabia. And he announced that we will subsidize wheat at 10 times the world price and gave interest-free loans to anybody who would develop those farms. And when that happened, the who's who of Saudi Arabia showed up at that dairy farm and the back window would roll down on a Rolls Royce or a big Range Rover. And there were two words that came out of their mouth in Arabic. Fen Ameriki, where's the American? They all wanted me to go build them farms. And so Nancy, who's a Billings girl and a botanist who I met at Montana State University, uh, she was stuck wearing black in Saudi Arabia uh, with me. And uh, we went out and uh, started building farms all over Saudi Arabia. And it was about food security. It was completely opposite of what the rest of the world is faced with when they have energy insecurity. Now, I didn't choose to go to Saudi Arabia. I didn't choose to go to Libya because that was the first place I wanted to go. Remember, I wanted to get down to someplace else, but those were the jobs I got. And I learned a lot about Islam, about Sunnis, and about Shia, about oil, about the Saudi royal family. I learned a fair bit uh, from Gaddafi as well. I only met him once. He came down to the farm. And remember, we're down on the Chad and Niger border. So we're a long ways away for anything. In order to get there from Tripoli, you took a one lane highway, not really a highway, but it was one lane traffic. And the, the, uh, the one that had the uh, ability was the one that was going south because they were usually loaded. And if you met somebody going north, you had to get off the road quickly. One time he came down and before he got there, he had several helicopters that arrived and unloaded his security people. And there were about 30 of them arrived before he got there. And they set up and they were all wearing complete garb and uh, semi-automatic weapons and et cetera, you might imagine. And then finally his helicopter arrived and he had about a dozen more with him. And uh, there was one thing that stuck out for this young guy from Montana and that all of his security, all of his security were women. 100%. Because Gaddafi, of course, at those days, was maybe the most wanted person on the planet. And he needed people he could trust. And he was convinced that women have a maternal instinct, and they will protect him. And uh, I can tell you, when I was governor, I looked for women to run government as well, because I needed people that I could trust. So I learned something from Gaddafi, not many people would uh, admit to that. <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I wrote a book about the future of energy, and uh, I'm not very smart. I spent most of 2014 researching this, and it was published in late 2014. And I uh, really only mentioned uh, two companies in this book. Uh, and, and I suggested that these are companies that are going to be very important in the future. I didn't invest in them. I didn't put any money in them, and that was kind of stupid. The two companies I mentioned was uh, Tesla, and uh, the other one is BYD, which is the Tesla equivalent in China. And if I had just put a few shekels uh, in both of those companies instead of writing a damn book, uh, I, uh, well, I'd still be here. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> Here's something that, uh, that drove me crazy the whole time I was in both Saudi Arabia and Libya. And that is that, of course, as you know, they, they have the oil. Uh, if we look at the map of the world, you'll see that uh, the United States has about 2% of the proven world oil reserves. Uh, Venezuela, number one, 18%. And then it's Saudi Arabia, 
and then it's Iraq and Iran and it's Libya, it's Kuwait. In fact, more than 50% of the proven reserves are within 500 miles of Israel in every direction, more than 50%. And then 18%, remember I mentioned was from Venezuela, real safe place to get your oil right. And uh, about 8% is from Russia. Those are the proven reserves. America, 2%. And we were talking about that earlier. Um, right around 14% of the oil is consumed uh, by the United States. And yet we only produce, only, only have proven reserves of 2%. I think the most important national security issue that we have is that we have 2% of the world's oil supply and we're consuming it at 14% per year. At some point we run out. We are in that car going 100 miles per hour and there's a cliff out there. I don't know how far that cliff is out there, but I can see where the cliff is. And we're not turning left, we're not turning right, we're not braking, in fact, we're accelerating. The one thing that we do know is that we're going to run out of oil in the United States before we're gonna run out of demand in the United States. And when we do, we will turn to, oh, I don't know, you pick your friend. You like Venezuela, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, it's your choice. Cause that's what we're gonna to have to choose. Oh, Russia, <laughs> choose Russia. So there's nothing more important to our security in this country than securing a domestic energy supply. Now, something I've thought about, you maybe have thought about this before, and uh, it's interesting because today in the United States and around the world, uh, solar energy is responsible for pretty close to 90% of all the energy. You're thinking, well, that guy, he's been smoking something. Uh, how could it be that much? Well, think about what solar energy is. Solar energy is energy that comes from the sun, right? Think about what happened 100 million years ago. The sun, before any of us and a lot of animals that you understand and know were here, was fueling all of the organic growth on the planet. And 100 million years later, it is stored, that solar energy is stored as oil, natural gas, and coal. They are the battery system that we use that was solar energy. Now, I would uh, suggest to you that's not a very efficient system of batteries. Uh, but we haven't come be much better than that in the last hundred years. Let's go back. You know, it was, it was the battle between Westinghouse and Edison. Some of you watched a movie about that. And Edison, uh, he was a scientist. He was a plinker. Uh, he had ideas. And, but Edison had an idea that we ought to locally produce our energy it ought to be direct current, and we locally produce it, locally consume it, and that was his notions. Westinghouse, Westinghouse had a different idea. He said, let's go to alternating current so we can use big transformers, and we can move that from 110 to 5,000 if we need it, and we can run transmission lines for hundreds of miles, maybe 500 miles, and then we only need a few of these generation plants across the country and they'll generate the electricity and we will deliver it to your home. That was Westinghouse's idea. Well, there was a rassle there in this country for about 15 years and Westinghouse, uh, he actually uh, hired a young man from Central Europe by the name of Tesla, who was the brains of the operation. He paid him enough and he won that battle. So we went to alternative AC electricity and we went to these huge power plants and we deliver transmission lines hundreds, thousands of miles across this country instead of locally producing that energy. Something else happened along that time. You know, around the turn of the century, people started buying cars. Cars became available. But did you know that in 1910, the Detroit Automobile Company made a car that they guaranteed when you drove it off the lot in 1910 that it could get 100 miles on a charge. It was an electric car. Now, at that time, uh, roughly 60% of the cars had already gone to a petroleum, but 40% were electric. There were a lot of electric cars. 
Uh, and there was kind of a difference of opinion up until about 1910. Interesting enough, uh, women preferred uh, electric cars and doctors preferred electric cars. Doctors preferred electric cars because they never had to worry about them starting. You just get in and you go. And as you can imagine when you were cranking those things, uh, sometimes they started, sometimes they didn't. And women, unlike the men who liked to buy cars in those days, when you owned a car, you were the first one in your neighborhood to own a car. Now, a man doesn't want to sneak into the garage with a car. A man wants to get in that damn car and drive down that street and have make enough noise that everybody looks out the window. Uh, the women weren't caring about that so much. They, they liked the silent car. But then about 1910, things changed because there was a fellow by the name of Ford that started making cars much less expensively and cheaper and better and cheaper and better and started taking not only uh, market share away from other gasoline cars, but taking away from electric cars because the electric cars were costing more. And so by 20 oh, some years later, the Detroit automobile company was no longer even making cars. Today, we have a problem with batteries. We, we don't have a shortage of energy. Well, okay, you can talk about oil and who's got it and who doesn't, but that's not the only source of energy. Uh, solar energy, wind power, and other sources. But the problem with those is you need batteries. You need battery technology. And 100 years ago, 110 years ago, we already had a car that could get 100 miles on a charge, and we have done very little to battery technology until about 15 years ago. We lost 100 years in the process. Now, it was interesting, uh, wind power. One time I was talking to my dad, you know, and he, he was culturally German, but they came from Ukraine and it had been a couple hundred years since they had, any of their family had been in Germany, but he spoke a kind of a German and he still kind of had a, a German way of thinking about things. My mother's Irish, so that's what gets me to the podium here. Uh, I asked him, well, dad, what was the biggest change on the farm when you got electricity? In the German way, thought a long time chewed his toothpick a little bit. He said, well, you know, we finally got uh, the REA, the rural electrification was FDR's brainchild. He was the opinion that we can't have pockets of poverty in an ocean of prosperity in America. And so all these small towns and all of these farmers, they deserve to have electricity too. And these big utilities that we had created in this country, they weren't gonna take those power lines out to little damn towns like the place I grew up or farms and ranches. And so the REA was created so we could get electricity. So he said, and so we got it in 1949. And he said, but the question is, what was the biggest change when the REA electricity came? And he said, well, it's because we could, we could weld on the farm at a little hotter temperature. They'd had a wind charger since 1920 with batteries in the basement. But he said, no, it wasn't a perfect system, those damn batteries. They had, you had to buy a new one about every three years. You had to keep them in the basement so they wouldn't freeze, and every once in a while they'd blow up. The problem in the system was the batteries. When that REA was formed, we had electricity from Alberta to Texas, from Nevada to Iowa. All across America, we had wind chargers with batteries. We had the model that Edison was talking about that many years earlier. We had locally produced energy but it was based on a battery system. Now today, we're talking about America with 2% of the proven oil reserves and using seven times that much. It was uh, 40, who were talking about that? It was, it was during the Ford administration. So that's nearly, that's 48 years ago, whatever, something like that. Um, we passed a law in this country and the law was you cannot export crude oil. And that was the law until 2016. You could produce crude oil in the United States, but you couldn't export it because we understood how important domestic oil was. Now, for a great part of that time, we were not self-sufficient. We were still importing oil. We were producing some and we were importing some, but it didn't make any sense to export it. Well, about 2014, 2015, you know, the, the folks that buy, uh, you know, the thick steaks and the old whiskey and campaign finances back there in Washington, D.C., they said, well, you know, 
our oil companies, uh, they, they need to be able to export some of this oil too. Uh, you know, they, they, they've got uh, uh, some of the best technology in the world. We're producing an oil, oil in places uh, that uh, nah, the rest of the world hasn't even thought about yet. Well, they got a lot of oil there in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and all the rest, but we have the technology. So um, just turn us loose. Let us produce more oil. Let us export if that's what it comes to. So we did change the law. Uh, so the price of gasoline, let's see, let me think about what it was, $2, $2.05 to $4. That's what happened. So we now do produce about as much as we consume, but we export a lot of oil. We're exporting, you know, one of the first things that we did when we started allowing the export of oil is we shut down refineries in the United States and we built refineries in Mexico. And we took that crude oil that we produced in the United States, we shipped it down to Mexico, we paid lower wages and produced the gasoline and diesel and shipped it right back to the United States. That was, that was a system that we created. It seems to me that it would make more sense, not only, not only because we only have 2% of the proven reserves, uh, but because it would make more sense for jobs in this country not to export that oil. The reason they export that oil, let me tell you why. Because gasoline prices and diesel prices are higher in 106 countries around the world than it is in the United States. And if you have that crude oil, you're going to try and ship it to the place that gives you the most money. But if we were in a situation that we could produce much more oil than we could consume in the United States, uh, maybe I'd think about that. But today, we're right at the edge. Some years a little more, some years a little less. But what we do know is that if we continue down that oil path, that we are headed for that cliff with only 2% of the world's oil supply. So I like, I like alternative energy. The concern I've got is batteries. I wrote a book, uh, as I mentioned to you, and uh, after I'd studied all of the energy worldwide and all the, the new sources of energy and the old sources of energy, and of course I talk about coal gasification, I talk about the Keystone Pipeline, a supporter of the Keystone Pipeline, I talked about coal, uh, and I suggest that uh, we uh, have an opportunity with coal. We can sequester the carbon and we can produce clean energy with coal. Now the problem is, is it would cost about six times as much as natural gas is worth to produce the natural gas. So until things change a great deal, that, that huge coal supply that we have in Montana, you know, if Montana were a country, we would rate number three in the world in coal reserves. Number one, the United States, number two, Russia, number three, Montana. We have more damn coal than anybody else. And in the lots of places in eastern Montana, you can kick the horse shit out of the way and you'll see coal right underneath it. It's very inexpensive to produce. The problem is, is, well, as you know, today, to produce electricity with coal is costing more than other ways of making electricity. And so coal plants all over the country are closing including in Montana. Uh, they have options. Well, you could take a 40-year-old coal plant and you could update that thing because they have a planned obsolescence of 30 and 40 years, but it would cost more to update those coal plants than it would cost to build new sources of energy. Let's talk about Montana and the possibility of wind power. Uh, there is a transmission line that was built so that we could deliver electricity from coal strips starting some 40 years ago to Portland and Seattle. And it comes right across Western Montana, goes across some terrain that I'm pretty sure would be pretty tough to get permits to put a big transmission line through there today. But that transmission line is already there. And what's interesting about wind, as you know, doesn't blow all the time. Sometimes it doesn't blow when you need it. So you're going to have to have some batteries and they're expensive and they're problematic. But in this particular case, it's kind of interesting because those big... Uh, coal plants that were built to deliver that electricity on that transmission line, they're in an area that has excellent wind, excellent wind, huge, big, open range country. And those transmission lines are already built to Portland and Seattle. Now the problem with that damn wind, it doesn't always blow. And of course in central and Eastern Montana, you know, it's more likely to blow in the spring than it is in the summer. And it's more likely to blow during the day than it does at night. And what are you going to do at night when you're trying to watch television? We can't get any electricity out of Montana. But what's interesting is if you take a look at the Columbia River Basin, 
that's running transmission line running right through it. They have excellent wind power as well. They built big wind farms there. And uh, <clears throat> you know, when our wind doesn't blow at night, theirs does. When ours doesn't blow in the summer, theirs does. You can firm wind on wind 90% between those two and those transmission lines are already there. So there's places and times that it'll work. I know that you're gonna hear that, my God, we'll never get to these electric cars. It's gonna to take too long. This discussion of 30, 20, 30 years from now, 70, 80% of cars being electric. But I'm gonna remind you, 110 years ago, we already had a car that could get 100 miles on a charge. And today we have nine. We haven't researched batteries. If that REA wouldn't have passed, if those farmers and small communities all over America, had they said that damn battery is the problem and they would have spent more money on that damn battery, if we'd have spent money on battery technology, imagine where we'd be. And then Westinghouse. Westinghouse, the brainchild of the American utility where we have monopolies in places all over America. You get your electricity from one company, right? Or any of you got two that you get to choose from? No, it didn't make sense, frankly, to have three wires running down every street because you had three electric companies. And so we created these monopolies and we gave them uh, opportunities to have, well, they get an 11% return and uh, they're supposed to take care of you because they always say they are. Uh, but sometimes they really take care of you. If you look at uh, the rest of the world, rest of the industrialized world, almost all of them have time of use metering. Time of use metering. The electricity is worth more uh, in the peak day than it is in the middle of the night. The electricity is worth more in the middle of winter when the temperatures are cold and people are using electricity. And it's worth less when you're not using more electricity. And what that does is it creates smarter users. And so that, well, if you can get your electricity for a little less, I think you're gonna um, run your dishwasher when that's not peak time, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you do something like that? Or if you had an electric car, imagine this. Imagine with your electric car and if it had a computer in it, let's see, I think it does. And that electric car, you drive, raise your hand if you drive more than five hours per day. Nobody? Raise your hand if you drive more than three hours per day. Somebody. Point is, that car is parked most of the time. If we had charging stations omnipresent and your car is parked whenever you're not driving it and your car is smart, smarter than you, and it knows when to buy and sell. It knows you're going to need 22 miles to get home at the end of the day and park at the, at the office and the price of electricity spikes because of whatever reason, you're selling electricity. And then in the middle of the night when you get home and it's plugged in at your house, it's buying electricity. So if we had, start picking a number, millions of cars storing electricity that become part of the battery system, that alleviates some of the problem we've got worldwide so that we can start using the electricity that's produced with wind power and solar power in a more efficient way. When I wrote that book, um, I didn't know how it was gonna end. I, I just wanted to learn about energy. So I looked at coal and I looked at oil and I looked at solar and I looked at hydrogen. And I looked at the history of all of them and where we're going and how we're getting there. And at some point, at some point, I said, well, hell, it's, 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 not, it's not about producing it, it's about storing it. And so I decided, uh, to name the book. And so I called some of my friends and some people I trust and said, okay, I finally have come up with a name for the book. And they said, well, what is it? And I said, it's the battery, stupid. No, no, you can't, you can't. Nobody's gonna buy a book, you're calling them stupid. No, 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 I explain, I, you know, the first chapter I explain, I'm the stupid one. <laughs> I explain, I didn't realize when I started writing about energy that it's about the battery, it's about storage because we have an unlimited supply of solar and wind power and other sources of energy. We don't have a problem. We have a problem with storage. And the problem is a storage system that we already have, that solar, coal, and oil that we talked to you about, 2% is what we have in the United States. And uh, the rest of the world, take, take a look at this map, for example. Take a look. So uh, we're talking about Israel these days, right? Can you find it? 
See it there? Um, see where it says Jordan, Syria, Israel's little small print, so you can't see it. Uh, we well, go about 500 mile radius around that, and you got 50% of the proven oil reserves in the planet. So yeah, let's see, Saudi Arabia and Libya and uh, Kuwait and uh, Iraq and Iran. Yeah, real, uh, real safe places, right? They're the places we can really depend on when we need them. Uh, oh, well, let's add, uh, let's add one more, Venezuela, which is the number one country. So you go with 50% plus 18%, we're almost at 70%, and most of them, well, you wouldn't trust them if you really needed them, would you? Now, going back to Saudi Arabia and Libya, living there, young guy from Montana. And I watched while this country that didn't respect any rights of any individual, when you worked in Saudi Arabia, it didn't matter whether you were management or owned a company there, or whatever you were, when you arrived, you handed your passport to the, your sponsor. You didn't even get to have a passport. You carried what was called an akama. And the akama was your walking around papers while you were there. And the only way you could leave the country is if that person let you leave the country. There were tens of thousands of third world nationals and some Europeans and Americans that were absolutely held as hostages there because they wouldn't let them leave. They wouldn't pay their salaries. They wouldn't take care of them. And I watched this country who, well, they're, Saudi Arabia is the most anti-democratic, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-woman's rights country on the planet and America's best friend. And I watched, well, America for the last 40 years, we wag our finger at countries all over the world, in particular in the Middle East and Venezuela. And we say, you don't have democracy. You don't treat your women correctly. Christians. Jews, you weren't even allowed. To. In fact, in Saudi Arabia, they are about 90% uh, Sunni, not Shia. You know, in Iran is mostly Shia, and then Iraq is about half and half. But in Saudi Arabia, you couldn't even practice your Shia religion, let alone Christian. You'd go to jail if you tried to have a church service in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, if you ever had the word Israel stamped in your passport, you were never allowed back in the country. And of course, women. And of course, I have a beautiful wife and she looks great in whatever she's wearing. But when she's all decked out and she's wearing black from all the way down, all the way down to her, every part of her body, what a beautiful woman. They, they cover their women. Uh, and our best friend, our best friend has none of those, those things that you think are important in America. And then we wag our finger at those countries in Iraq, in Iran, in Egypt, in Pakistan, and we tell them they ought to be more like America. And just think about what's going through the minds of the people in those countries and their leadership when we're wagging our finger at them and putting our arm around the Saudi royal family. Well, I'm going to leave with that, but I will say this. Uh, I've been, I think it's over 40 countries now, I've been to around the world. And uh, I remember where it all started with Mrs. Deegan, and it was about Argentina. I finally, I finally did make it to Argentina, and I did make it to see those glaciers, and I saw those spectacular rivers. And then the place that that ranch boy from the Judith Basin in Montana wanted to see more than anything was the Pampas of Argentina. I made it to the Pampas of Argentina where the grass, remember, how tall is the grass? As high as the saddle horn of a horse. And so I got there, and it sure as the hell was. But what I found out when I got to Argentina, their horses are not very big. Thank you very much. Listen, let's have a conversation about the, the future of energy. Oh, okay, okay. How do we, we get in here? Uh, Brian, what is it from here? Okay. Okay, I'll come over there.
and whenever the green light. I can see it's already set up. I'm on the far left here. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess it depends on the perspective. You see me on the right. <laughs> That's been going on for years. <laughs> well, thank you for that presentation. I'm going to be introducing uh, Jennifer. I'm making sure. But something just occurred to me as I was listening to you, Brian. You were talking about all different types of resources. And I'm thinking that there's one resource that is ultimately the most important resource of all the ones that you mentioned. Any guesses? Human. Thank you. Human capital, our most important resource. And while uh, Mayor Dad was very gracious in recognizing many of the people that put this conference together, it's my opportunity to have you stand. Yes, sir. Yes. Talking about human capital and people that have made this community and this state a wonderful place and continues to add with conferences like this. If he won't stand up, then we will say thank you so very much. Jennifer Warren, 1989, she graduated from the London School of Economics with a master's in science and European studies. She graduated from University of Denver with a double major in finance and marketing. She also studied Russian for four years. And I gotta just very quickly tell you this story. I subscribed to Seeking Alpha. I had read an article that she had on Seeking Alpha and I went, this person knows what they're talking about. Now, maybe my own biases clatter my judgment, but I do a radio show and often my guests are as simple as that's an interesting person. And I contact them and I tell them about the show in Montana and then they're on the radio here. It's not very complicated. Well, I sent you an email. I didn't hear from you. Didn't take it personal. You're busy. Oh, did, okay. We can talk about this. All right. Six months later, six months later, I followed up at my mistake. I got to get more help. And here she is today. That was the beginning of this relationship. So Jennifer's worked across decades in the areas of finance, global economics, and sustainability as it relates to capital flows, energy, and resources. The energy systems transformation with attention to resource sustainability and investment have been active themes in her work in print, through panels, videos, and presentations. Her work reflects the evolution of these themes, telling the stories of those who are making a difference in helping develop new offerings that reflect the needs of the market. She served as CEO of Dallas Committee on Foreign Relations from late 2010 to spring 2013. In addition to updating the research of DCFR, she produced 20 to 25 globally focused high-level speaker events annually. Now, we bring people that we have some relationships with. They have outstanding, exquisite backgrounds, experts in what they do. But when they come here, something happens. And the most important thing when they leave, they're a part of Montana and they're our friends. And I can't say any more to how, uh, with gratitude, it's been a pleasure to have you, to learn from you, to have you participate here today. So without further ado, Jennifer Warren. I really didn't have any planned remarks. My my whole plan was that I was going to ask um, Governor Schweitzer some questions so that we could have this energy dialogue. Is that what I'm supposed to do, um, Bob? Yes. Um, and this is not working, so I, I think I'm going to have to stand. Please do. Um, yeah, this is a... Uh, is there a green light on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll sit. <laughs> Make this simple. You can stand. We'll, you can sit. You can dance. We're okay. We'll, whatever. We'll cross talk here. Um, so, um, okay, fine. Um, so, I just wanted to ask you from your time in Saudi Arabia, um, what do you see as the key differences now in in what's happening in the in politics and conflicts compared to when you were there? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest changes is education. I think uh, members of the royal family um, are more likely to have had educations outside of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, uh, it used to be that uh, 
they were pretty careful on which of members of the royal family or anybody else from Saudi Arabia that they let out of the country because they didn't really want to see him what the rest of the world was doing. Uh, they wanted to keep their thumb on and keep it protected. I think, uh, uh, and to some degree, um, the uh, the cloak is is off of uh, Saudi Arabia. So so many young people have been educated outside, have come to universities, have learned the Western way, and it's tough for them to go back and uh, get dressed up in black and do what they're told, uh, when they're told, and how they're told. Uh, the things that they must eat and the things they can't eat and the things that they can start as a business. And so I think uh, uh, they, like the rest of the world, has started to get that internet to come there and started to get new ideas. Uh, the Saud royal family would like not, not to have those new ideas occurring in Saudi Arabia. They'd like to be able to keep their thumb on it. We were talking about that earlier. There's some, how many thousand cousins? 7,000 cousins of the Saud royal family. And uh, you know they didn't get their job through an election. They took it with force and they hold it with force. There are many, many, many clans and families in quote, Saudi Arabia that are not Sauds. And uh, they would do, they would like nothing more than to throw the Sauds out and perhaps even uh, change some of the social issues that they've got there. So it sounds like, you know, something just came to mind with what you're saying is it sounds like, you know, we're, we're in the middle of these generational shifts. In, in some respects, and you see that playing out in Iran, Saudi Arabia. So it sounds like sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, the old guard is holding on and, and then and the younger generations are wanting to, you know, are pushing up against that. And, and there's a lot of violence connected to this. Um, <clears throat> what do you see, um, what do you see as off ramps for this? You know, how this could change. And we see this in this Hamas, Israeli problem, you know, with Iran using Hamas as a proxy and all that. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts about how how this could move forward or change without, you know, this horrible? There is no elections. We're talking about countries that don't have elections. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of people can say, I don't like it here. I don't like what we're doing around here. Um, and they can either leave the country or go to jail. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, it's Sharia law. And uh, you have no rights. If, you, uh, if you're not a Muslim, you're not even allowed in the courtroom. Somebody accuses you of something, you did it because everybody in the courtroom says you did. Uh, the Saud royal family, uh, they're not going to give this up without a fight. Uh, in Iran, they're not going to give it up without a fight. And, and just let me, let me mention something here about Iran and uh, Hamas. Uh, Iran is more likely to be working with Hezbollah, their Shia, and uh, Hamas is a Sunni. And uh, let's just say they don't get along. So it may well be that uh, Iran would use Hamas for a short period of time. They don't trust each other uh, either. In Saudi Arabia, they're, you know, like I said, 90% Sunni. Uh, uh, it's, not even, it's not even legal to openly practice uh, the Shia religion, which is also a Muslim religion. And, and what, what is disturbing and the reason Iran may well be involved in this is we were very close over the course of the last year of having our, uh, Saudi Arabia recognize Israel. Remember I said, you're not even allowed to put Israel on a passport if you wanted to enter Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you freely admitted that you've even been to Israel, you weren't allowed in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is strange enough. I mean, that's like us saying, nope, Kansas doesn't exist. Don't believe in them. That's what they've been doing for the last 70 years. And we were li literally <clears throat> within months of Saudi Arabia recognizing Israel, which would have been a huge change in the Middle East. And with this blow up of uh, Sunni Hamas, it may well be that that has been put on the back burner. And that's the biggest concern. Mm -hmm. Who's behind it? I'm not sure, but I know that uh, uh, Iran is more likely to have influence with people who are Shia than they do Sunni. Um, this just kind of leads to another question. You know, in Saudi Arabia, MBS is trying to diversify their economy, trying to you know, make it so they're, they're not so oil dependent in the future. That's the goal or, or the intent. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, in Iran, you know, needs their gas revenues and all this. I'm just wondering, will there ever be a time when maybe um, energy and economy starts trumping the power politics? Um, I mean, 
it would take the royal family who's in charge of everything that moves in Saudi Arabia to say we're out of here because that's the way it ends. Those 7,000 cousins, uh, most of them would get a bullet in the back of their head if uh, if there was a revolution there. And it's not going to happen through an election. And by the way, this notion that uh, MBS is going to change Saudi Arabia and all this discussion about this new city that's going to be built in the middle of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be from the Judith Basin in Montana to know what bullshit is. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they can oftentimes say the right thing. But ultimately, the goal, the goal, number one, two, three, four, five, is to remain in power. So you think all those neo um, advertisements in the Wall Street Journal are BS? Um, <laughs> I've seen that. Well, and I've seen again, that if you are the out. most anti-democratic, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-woman regime on the planet, and you want to be friends with people who say we, we don't share any of your values, you probably ought to talk about something else. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for saying bullshit, yeah, I guess. So you know, this is a big city and everything. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of subterfuge going on. Um, so, um, so what role do you see uh, for energy playing at all in any of these key conflicts like Israel, Hamas, Iran, Russia, Ukraine? I mean, do you have any thoughts about sort of the energy absolutely i mean of all this in particular europe uh germany in particular and most of the rest of europe became completely dependent on natural gas that came uh out of russia and uh now you have a ukrainian conflict war what do you want to call it and uh, they've lost that natural gas and you know natural gas uh, when you compress natural gas it costs about uh, seven eight times more than it does getting natural gas in a pipeline mm -hmm. and so it's driven the price of natural gas sky high uh not to suggest that there isn't a little bit of sneaking around the corner all over the world and people getting energy out of russia and claiming they didn't or to ship it someplace and then ship it back but in particular those pipelines it's it's tougher to hide it mm -hmm. and so yes energy is playing a role has played a role there i mean the reason we have kowtowed and they've kowtowed to us and why we've been romancing saudi arabia for the last uh, 70 years, knowing they don't share any of our values is because they're sitting on oil and Standard Oil of California, Chevron, is a partner to Ramco. Let's, uh, let's just lay it out there. That's who it is and that's who we are. Um, this kind of leads to two other questions. So you mentioned Ramco and then I'm also I got to remember this China question. So with them, okay, so Aramco now, you know, it's on the Riyadh Stock Exchange, right? And they were also floating the idea of trying to, you know, have it listed in other stock exchanges and, and or, uh, you know, get more investors. Um, do you think that that's really something that will happen? Because it seems like, I don't know if it's that they need the capital, want the capital, or if it's just a way to open up. Um, what are your thoughts about that potential? I think that I think that they are plumb serious about um, um, raising money by making it a, a publicly traded company. But uh, if you think for one minute that a country like Saudi Arabia that controls Aramco is going to abide by the laws that we would have on Wall Street of what a company must disclose and cannot disclose, um, I uh, I got. Uh, I got some land in downtown Dallas that I'll sell you for three dollars an acre. Yeah. yeah, it won't happen anymore with the um, deck park we built in the middle of the city. <laughs> um, the the real estate values are sky high. Um, so so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So yeah, transparency has been yeah the problem with Aramco going forward, and and they still haven't quite figured out the valuation because they just can't get over that hurdle. You meant there was something about oh I know what it was. So China is now. Um, Saudi Arabia's, you know, biggest customer. We're not, you know, because now we're producing a lot more oil, um, exporting it, as you mentioned. And so there's that pivot to Asia idea, um, but it's it's all based on, um, you know, oil and economics. Do you think that that's a strong enough relationship for us to worry about the China Saudi relationship, or is there another way to look at that? I think we should be concerned about it. Uh, China is um, is building their power around the world, and uh, all the third world countries that I go to, um, I'm a partner in a sustainable forestry project in Gabon, and uh, the Chinese are everywhere there. Of course, they're everywhere in the Congo, they're everywhere in Angola, they're everywhere in Latin America. They need resources, and they're getting resources all over the world. And uh, they're 
uh, creating friends may not be what they're doing, but they're creating alliances. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the Saudis, uh, they need us too, because 98% of all of their defense is us. And in fact, what's interesting for you is, uh, well, we were in Saudi Arabia, sometimes we'd see the uh, Saudi military out on maneuver and they'd have, you know, we'd be going, remember we, we had projects all the way uh, from the Jordan border all the way to the Yemeni border. We like having farms in North Dakota and Montana and Wyoming and Kansas and Texas. That's how far spread out where we are. So we were on the road a lot. And uh, sometimes we would uh, be along and here, here would be uh, 40 tanks out on uh, maneuvers. And, uh, you know, they have the, the door open because it's hot in there and they'd be looking around and it would be 105 degrees, but they'd be, you know, on top of the tank and one person would be down in and they'd shift back and forth. And nearly every one of them was a Pakistani, not a Saudi. And uh, the bulk of their uh, military uh, is Egyptian and Pakistani because the Saudi royal family isn't necessarily sure that they could count on uh, Saudi citizens to be on their side. So they need our military support. Uh, we protect them from this uh, dispute, ongoing dispute with Iran, which is cultural, it's religious, uh, it's historical, and uh, we supply the arms. Interesting enough, in most of the conflicts around the world, the United States supplies the arms for both sides. And uh, <laughs> See, um, people aren't ready to throw us over because they need our military support. Right. So that's sort of our, our big card, our ace up the sleeve. And we should be proud of that. But we also have the energy ace, <laughs> ace up the sleeve um, from what I was talking about earlier. Um, something else I wanted to ask you about, because you were talking about batteries and renewables, and we know that um, you know China has the lead on a lot of the um, you know minerals processing, battery storage processing. You know, they're sort of ahead you know, on a lot of the supply chains and, and all that um, with all the you know, energy transition. And obviously that's sort of like one of their, their geopolitical cards. Um, they want the energy transition to go that way, right? Um, so, and then we passed all this legislation to try to incentivize, you know, all, all that. And um, do you have any thoughts about what you see in that space with us and what we're trying to do? So today, the battery of choice and will be for at least 10 years uh, uh, is lithium. And there's a limited supply of lithium around the world. Uh, the biggest mines are, of course, uh, in South America and Chile, which is quasi-friendly in Peru, quasi-friendly. We have a lithium, big lithium mine in uh, Nevada that's opening up. Mm -hmm. um, it's... Uh, they have some, they have some uh, essential metals in China, but for the most part, uh, China is uh, racing around the world to get those same metals as other people are. But um, I don't believe, I'm an optimistic person, but I don't believe that the lithium battery 15 years from now will be the primary source. There are billions of dollars being invested in new uh, energy systems, new storage systems. And uh, we're going to find those systems that uh, are, uh, are greener because what we've got today isn't, you know, you, you drive that electric car, you own an electric car. So come on, you're liars out there. Some of you got electric cars. It's They're cool. I mean, they, they, you know, <laughs> go to zero to 60 in about four seconds and they don't make any noise. And, uh, but the problem is, is that their batteries get two, 300,000 miles and there's really no way of recycling them. And we just take them uh, and we dump them in the landfills. That can't continue. So we've, we need to make our storage system uh, cleaner and greener and less expensive. But of course, if you, if you look at this chart, I'm just making a chart here. You got the X and Y axis. Uh, if you look at the cost of solar energy over the last 40 years, this is what it's done. It's gone way, way down. Here's another one. Here's what battery storage cost has been in the last 20 years. It's going to continue. So the cost of uh, storing electricity um, and the, uh, the ability to, to recycle the metals in those batteries is going to improve with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, um, there's a young gentleman that set up a battery recycling plant next to a gigafactory in California. And he, he's, I think he's gonna win an award this at my thing in Dallas coming up in a couple of weeks. So yeah, that definitely, the opportunity for recycling all sorts of things is, is going to change, you know, the circular economy, right? Um, just let's hope we do better than batteries. Then <clears throat> a lot of the, uh, 
uh, refuge, uh, refuse uh, companies across America. You know, you've got one, one uh, for recycling of your plastics and another one for your paper and another one for your other garbage. We do in Missoula, right? Yeah. Um, and around the country, we've got that. And about half of them, you know what happens? They all go into the same landfill because they're not set up to do anything with uh, recycling them. Mm -hmm. So we need to do a little better job. Um, was there anything else before we open it up, probably to the audience, if there's any questions? I was just going to quickly ask you about the forest project in Gabon. Um, is that like a um, um, restorative project? Is it a carbon offset project? What's so the Gabon, nature of it? Gabon is, um, is uh, probably the most environmentally conscious country in Africa. Now, the bar is low, granted. <laughs> Gabon is about the size of Colorado geographically. It's on the equator. Um, there's about 1.8 million people and almost live, all of them live along the coast. And the rest of the country is rainforest. They're surrounded by Cameroon and uh, Congo, Angola. And uh, in the countries that surround them, they've killed 90% of all the ivory bearing animals that they have there, their elephants and their rhinos. Uh, in Gabon, uh, that 90% of them still exist. Uh, their biggest war is fighting the poachers that are coming in from those other countries. And uh, cooler than all of that is they have 300,000 lowland gorillas that live there. Uh, they live in the rainforest. Nancy and I had an opportunity to go out and see them. Um, a, an industrialist from Germany funded this uh, some 20 years ago. These, uh, these creatures um, are very shy and they live in a rainforest. And so it's very difficult for you ever to see one. They can swing through the trees faster than you can run. They can hear you coming, they can hide. They live in families. There'll be one male with four or five wives and, uh, and they raise their families in that way. Uh, but uh, this guy funded uh, the people in Gabon to uh, pick out a family and then start traveling with them. And they've had humans with them now for about the last 15 years. And so they allow humans to come to be with them. During the dry season, six months, they allow four people um, once a day for one hour as tourists to go out and be among this family. That's all. And uh, about, you have to walk quite a ways in the rainforest to get to them. They're always communicating on radio to see where they're at about uh, 30 minutes or an hour out before you get there. You put a mask on. This was before COVID. You put a mask on so that you didn't spread human diseases. And uh, so Nancy and I, we got a chance to go out and watch a uh, lowland gorilla family and the way they interacted and it was like families that you know. It was mothers screaming at their child to get the hell off of that tree before you break your neck. And it was uh, the father over there, the big gray guy. When the noise got too much and the, the ladies started yelling at each other, he walked way over and covered his ears because he didn't want to get involved in the argument. <laughs> Family <laughs> so dynamics. The answer to the question is, um, what we have is uh, the ability to harvest trees. Uh, we harvest three species out of about 100 that are there. And we harvest one tree every three acres. Imagine that one tree every three acres uh, because we're keeping it sustainable. Yeah. And uh, that's the way forward. Yeah, cool. Well, that's a nice story. I like that. That's a great way to sort of seg. Um, so I guess I'll just open it up to questions. Does anybody have a question? You can come to the mic or ask it loudly. <laughs> well. That is true. The first brought by Volkswagen about about capital. You know, you know, electricity is programmed by supply demand. It's also a commodity. That means there's speculation. And remember, before you before you were governor, the Montana Power was an icon of regulating company delivering electricity at a certain fixed rate. So they, they put increase, and uh, both Gannon and company and conflict with uh, 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 Goldman Sachs destroyed that magnificent regulated capitalist company turning into a fiasco. Right? <laughs> and you know, uh, and wrong. And wrong scandal, they would withhold uh, the flow of electricity to California going to the market, etc. So, are you for a regulated market of energy 
of an irregulated market. Mm. And my second point is not only talk about uh, nuclear energy. Mm. France gets seventy percent of its uh, power from nuclear energy. It's safe. Sixty-five uh, percent of the nuclear waste is recycled in Le Hague. Germany is looking back upon the mistake they did of jettisoning uh, nuclear energy. Anyway, uh, perhaps there is a nuclear future for Montana, especially over from the very good questions. Um, we'll start with uh, regulated versus deregulated energy. Um, if we, you know, we go back to the Westinghouse model versus uh, the Edison model and locally producing and, uh, and, and perhaps even having storage today versus having these big uh, generation plants and transmission lines that go thousands of miles, uh, which is what we're stuck with today. It doesn't make any sense to have three utilities running three separate wires down a street. And so we've created this regulated economy. But you know what? This regulated economy depends on having people that are elected that actually regulate them and don't roll over like fat dogs and get scratched on the belly when they get uh, uh, big martinis and thick steaks and re-election funds. And that's what we've got all over this country. We have these regulated utilities who aren't uh, the most efficient, don't plan to be, because you see, they get 10 or 11% profit based on how much they are worth and how much they spend. So why would they spend less? Why would they challenge any expense? We have utility companies all over America that are in great big buildings that are only half full, but you're paying for it. And they make 11% each time you do pay for it. So we need, if we're gonna have uh, regulated uh, utilities, we need to regulate them. We can't just uh, be regulated by them. And that's what's happened all over this country. Nuclear energy. I think we we're well on our way. We were well on our way. And then Two Mile Island leaked in the United States. Okay, then there was a big leak in Ukraine, but you know, Russians and you know, vodka and you know, uh, it happens. But then in Japan, you know, in, in Japan, people plan to plan to be planning and then plan some more. And it happened in Japan. No question about it. They made a mistake. And you're correct. In France, some 70% of the electricity is coming from nukes. Uh, but the world ran away from it. They said, oh boy. And then in this country, in this country, we still haven't figured out what we're going to do with this irradiated material. Uh, right now, at the nuke plants that we have, they have big parking lots that they haven't parked out there because they haven't found anything to do with it. And then our scientists keep telling us, you know, we're only 20 years out from fusion. And once we get to fusion, you no know, fission is where you split an atom, fusion where you put the two together, you get more energy and there's almost no radiation. We're very close, we're 20 years out with fusion. And that's what they said 20 years ago. And they said 40 years ago, and they said 60 years ago. And so we keep thinking fusion is going to be that way. Um, there's going to continue to be nukes built around the world, but nukes aren't cheap anymore. By the time you consider uh, taking care of the radiation, um, there are other sources of energy that might be less expensive. Uh, certainly in places like the United States where we have broad expanses, where solar, wind power, we have natural gas, we have oil, uh, we're not gonna rush to nukes in the United States anytime soon because of regulation. And I, I would view for you students that are here, during your lifetime, I think we'll have fusion. And I think uh, we will be looking at uh, we will look, look at nukes, but it won't be fission. It'll be fusion, is my opinion. Um, I just want to quick add a, a comment. So Texas has a completely um, de deregulated um, system. And and that was some of the problem with what happened with winter storm Uri. Partially, there was a weather problem. But because of that, that lack of capacity that happened, we're, we're going, we're having to add in some backup capacity, you know, and so they're trying to tweak that to see how, so how, how they can do that. But on the nuclear um, question, there definitely is more movement towards um, small scale modular systems. Also, you know, talk of thorium, there's been talk of thorium for like 25 years, and I know India is a big thorium producer. Um, you know, we just we just opened a really large nuclear plant. I can't remember if it's Georgia or South Carolina, but I know it's one of those districts. Um, so I think because of the need for baseload, you know, and 
if there's a really a desire for carbon free energy and you need that density and you're going to have all these data centers and you're going to have AI and you're going to have tons of phones and everything, you know, then that's going to require more base load because um, um, wind and solar aren't, aren't going to be able to handle it without battery and storage, which, you know, that, that's, that just adds a lot of cost in, in some respects. So it's just really a race. And I know that there's a lot of um, incentives in the um, Inflation Reduction Act legislation, as well as the infrastructure bill that were passed. So that's kind of a signal, you know, to, to start doing more research, because we just, we stopped researching it because of all the sentiment. So it doesn't mean there's not a comeback. And if, if we're serious about um, decarbonization, then nuclear will have to be on the table increasingly. And I think there's that realization, you know, so. Other questions? Sorry for keeping on the nuclear topic. I got this argument last time. We had this conference as well in favor of thorium. But <laughs> yeah, regarding your um, storage capacity for these batteries, I was doing some digging, and there are atomic batteries being researched that utilize atomic waste that last for more than centuries. I was wondering if you had any input on that kind of topic. I don't really, but uh, um, if we can find any uses for that irradiated material, uh, perfect. And if we can add a storage as part of it, great. Uh, but you still have to sell that to the American people. Because all over America, when you say, you know what, we're thinking about creating a thousand jobs in our neighborhood. Great. People rub their hands together. And there will be 300 jobs for engineers, high paying jobs in this. Well, that is perfect. I, I can't wait. And it's going to be built just outside of the city. So you'll be able to drive back and forth to work. It's going to be wonderful. And you say, well, what is this? And you say, well, it's new. You don't even finish nuclear, nuclear before they say, oh, because that's the reputation it's received because of one island, one island <laughs> on the East Coast and one Japanese and one Ukrainian problem. And people, they only see stuff glowing in the middle of the night. And so we have to convince the people of America as well that we're on that path and that we can make it work. And when we look at France and we say, but they made it work, people change the subject. Um. I just want to say, I think, I think there's also some generational issues, right? So, uh, you know, I, I think the worm is turning, <laughs> you know, in, in some respects as well, you know, um, it's just like power changes, you know, different sentiment about energy sources, different thinking about energy sources. Um, so, I mean, I think everything is possible, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you're serious about decarbonizing, you know, and and I don't think you can turn back all the advances that we're having, all these seriously, you know, serious advances, um, like even in India. I mean, they have some of the most amazing scientists that are doing really amazing work in fission and fusion and, and all of it. So I think it's just, you know, I think there's just going to be breakthroughs that we can't even imagine, you know, it, that are different than than fission as well, fission, fusion. So. We would prefer answers. <laughs> <laughs> Solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, they get a lot of bad press. Mm -hmm. and they take up a lot of land and kill birds. And, and they don't like them in their backyard and all these things. But, so I, I just like to hurry and address those two issues, probably both of you. Maybe, maybe you don't agree. I don't know. But I'd like to hear it. Do you want to start or you want me to? Go ahead. Okay, because I've been in the panhandle a lot in Texas, where, where it is Wind Farm City. And um, I know what you're saying about the NIMBY, not in my backyard situation. And that's happening a lot with solar 
all over the country, um, you're seeing a lot of pushback on on that, and and in on the East Coast, offshore wind, all all that. Um, you know, one of the challenges it is the transmission, and that's what we're bumping up against in Texas. And we built these um, high voltage lines called Cres lines all over West Texas, and it was a, a resounding success. Uh, the people in Davos were like, oh, that's the model. You know, we should do Cres lines like Texas. Well, you know what's happening in Texas? They're never going to be built again. You cannot get the consensus anymore because not in my backyard issues, you know, the very things you're saying. Um, there's a um, hedge fund manager who's, um, I, I've interviewed him a lot and he started out as a renewables executive. And he was talking about this penetration of, further wind, uh, further solar, um, that there's natural limits because of the siting issues, because a lot of the, the best sites have been taken, you know, just kind of like when you're um, drilling for oil, you know, with the shale wells, oh, we've used up the tier one acreage, we're going to tier two. It's kind of that thinking, right? Now, there are windy places, you know, in different parts of the country. The center of America is a highly windy region you know if you look at the wind resources maps and i've seen those maps it's really really interesting to look at where all the high speeds are and everything and so you've got to get the transmission out you know if you could if you could concentrate those wind farms where there's the resource and then do some smart transmission projects that would be one thing but we're such a hodgepodge with states and their various grids you know there's like what five grid systems around the country we have our own grid called ERCOT. Um, and so, and that's why the Cres lines could easily be built. I know there are transmission projects for renewables in the Miso um, district. I think that's the K Kansas and somewhere else. Uh, don't quote me. I was just looking at that very gingerly. And um, you know, so there's it's expensive uh, transmission. I calculated in Texas. I called that story the Texas million dollar miles. It's because each mile of transmission costs a million bucks and the ratepayer has to pay for it. But really it's more than a million, it's more like 2 million bucks a mile. And so that's the other part of it is the cost equation. So there's just a lot of things that have to be worked out and optimized and you know, people have to put their heads down and really figure out what's a priority and, and how are we gonna pay for it? You know, and just get that will um, going. I don't even know if I answered your question, but that, that was what I had. <laughs> well, let me go to dams. I'll switch. Oh, I'll thank switch. you. I'll, I'll, you I'll go to dams. <laughs> so the TVA, the tell us, Tennessee Valley Authority um, built uh, dozens, 100 uh, dams 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, all over the Midwest. And uh, it was a great source of jobs and a good source of energy, a lot of electricity then created. And the planned obsolescence of those dams were 40, 50 years. And so now those dams, here's the dam, here's the water, here's the silt that's built up. And so the silt is built up almost to the surface of those. They're beyond the planned obsolescence. The silt weighs more than water. They weren't engineered to have that much. And during the next 20 years, there will be more money spent taking hydro dams out and trying to find a solution for that silt because when you just blow a dam up and that silt goes down, it kills every creature in that river for the next 50 or 100 miles. And whoever lives there is not going to put up with that. We look at the Columbia River Basin and the dams that were built there and the questions about what we've done to the salmon population. Um, there will be new ways of building dams that uh, are able to get around some of the problems that we had with some of the old construction. But uh, we're going to have a big problem in this country taking out some of those old dams and replacing that energy with something else. However, there is one, and that's uh, pump storage. Mm. Uh, pump storage has been used for more than 100 years, South America and US and Europe. And that is when you have more electricity from wind or solar or some other source than you need, you just use that electricity, that excess electricity, you pump water up onto a mountain into a big pond. And then that pond is there. And when you need electricity, when there's a peak demand, you release it right back down through that turbine. And so we will, building, we will be building a lot of pumped storage um, all over this country. And that's gonna be another one of the battery systems that we use. Mm. Um, I, th I think on wind farms, um, I mentioned I mentioned early on that uh, from 1920 to about 1950, we had wind turbines all over from Alberta all the way to Texas and, and from Nevada all the way to Iowa. 
We had them scattered and they were sitting by, beside every farmhouse in America. Uh, all over the range land in uh, the United States, we still have turbines that are pumping water for the cattle. So there's small ones that are out there. And uh, you betcha, people don't want change. I don't want a bunch of damn wind turbines out there. I've been looking at those mountains and they're only 29 miles away and I don't want to have to look through those things. Good, we'll put up a coal plant. No, you're not going to put up a coal plant. Well, how about a nuke? Well, we have a clean nuke. You're not putting a nuke in there. Well, what about a solar farm? You won't, it won't, you know, they're only about that high and you'll still be able to, we don't want no damn solar farm here. We just want electricity. Okay. Uh, there's sacrifices that we make for this technology, sacrifices that we make for electricity, if that's what you want. And we have to make decisions. And uh, there's going to be some people that have things in their backyard. You know, I, I live up at Sealy Lake and I kind of like it that I'm 50 miles from the nearest traffic light. I get into Missoula and I got to have my wife with me to say, okay, turn here, <laughs> slow down. Oh, wait, it's red. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't like having a bunch of traffic lights and a lot of uh, traffic either, but I like coming to Missoula because I like the people here. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we do have a serious problem with taking a lot of dams out right now, and we're going to have to move on it. But a very good question. Um, I just had one quick uh, comment, some color, what he was saying about hydropower dams um, and pump storage. Um, when I was at this conference of the Richmond Fed in the spring, the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, was there discussing their, um, you know, their decarbonization efforts, and they're, um, they're like 60% um, green now, and they were really, um, like, saying how how much they liked their their dam the hydropower and using pump storage and that that the, they thought that that was a really great resource and they were really glad they had it and so it was you know just just to add to your comment absolutely that's that's a really good use you know in the future thank you thank you governor Schreister. thank you jennifer for a wonderful discussion Thank you to all to all for coming and participating and asking your questions. We wish you a very safe and wonderful night. And we hope to see you here next year. Thank you so much. Thank you.